Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to come before you. Jesus, we love you and we pray that this day you would renew our faith, renew our strength. Give us, Lord, your blessing, God. And Lord, I come humbly before you that, Jesus, you would give me the revelation from you that you want, Father, this morning. And Father God, Lord, I put myself at your disposal. Father, I thank you for every brother and sister here, Lord, that you will bless them and anoint them today in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, we had a big sporting event, not just Britain, but an international sporting event a couple of months ago. Anybody watch it? Anybody know what it might be? No, it's not rugby. <laughs> I, like, I like that. It might have been rugby. It's not Arsenal. Exactly. Even bigger than that. It's the Olympics. And um, I was uh, never great at uh, sport at school. I was always the, the boy you didn't want on your team. You know, when they come to pick teams, you know, I was sort of last one on the bench. You know, unfortunately, all the other people got chosen way ahead of me. And uh, I was the sort of person who, if I was on the football field, I'd be looking at the grass just as the, the ball sails by, sort of into the goal. Uh, but uh, even I acknowledge that there are important things you can learn from sport, aren't there? Uh, and, and, and the lessons it gives us. And I was watching the Olympics, and God spoke to me about some of the, the lessons that were there on display at the Olympics. I mean, we, we, the Olympics are the end games. They're the culmination, aren't they, of an awful lot of sweat and tears and toil. Um, but it's what they represent that gives us something in God as Christians that we can learn from. I mean, Great Britain, we did well, didn't we? It was 67 medals overall, 27 of them gold. It was our best performance since 1908. I don't know who was competing in 1908, but, you know, really good performance above China in the medals table. And people thought, you know, Great Britain, they wouldn't do better than last time because it's a rarity, isn't it, for a country after it's had the games on home soil for it to, in the next one, exceed that. But, but they did. And, you know, names like Nicola Adams, you've got Mo Farah, Adam Peaty, you know, these are household names. And, and their achievements represented something, didn't they? And, and as I say, I wasn't a great athlete. I'm not an athletic person. Uh, but I think in the physical, we sometimes see lessons that are useful for us in the spirit. And, and we're not just talking about winning gold in the natural, but I've titled my message today, Winning Gold in God. Winning Gold in God. I want to be a winner, you know? Athletes don't take part in order not to win, to pass the ticker tape, the finishing line, do they? They're not in it just purely for enjoyment. They are in it to, to achieve something. And, and I want, you know, uh, and, and I, I love my relationship with God and I love the presence of God, but we are here to do something, aren't we, for God? And, you know, sometimes people think they, they run the race, you know, to kind of qualify. And God would say, look, you know, you're not running the race of life in order to qualify. You've already qualified. You know, you're already loved by God. You're already won by him. You know, you're in the race because you are a child of God, not to become one, you know. Um, but we're in this race of life to do something for him and, and to be a blessing for, for him. And um, if we look at the book of Hebrews, if you want to turn there, chapter 12, and verses 1 to 2. Just put your thumb there and keep it in mind. You might have seen Mo Farah winning double-double that day when he got double gold after double gold in, in 2012. One of the greatest Olympians ever. One of just the greatest runners whatsoever. And it's almost like, you know, came from utter obscurity to, to world prominence through sport through his achievement through his effort and ability just to to break through and um, if we turn if you're in Hebrews 12 because this book in the Bible is written 
to people who knew all about the Olympics, yeah? There was the ancient Olympics that started several centuries before the birth of Christ, and then they had a break, they were cancelled for a bit, and then we have the modern Olympics that started up sort of late 1800s. But this audience that was being written for in Hebrews, whether Paul was writing or whether it was Barnabas was the writer, we, we don't totally know, but we know this letter was written to people, Christians, who were going through persecution, yeah? So they were mostly Jews who were probably having second thoughts. They think, well, this is the, the race we're in. I'm not sure I want to carry on with this race. Maybe there's another race we, we want to join. So there were people whose hearts were fluttering, whose, whose um, you know, resolution was, was wavering. You know, people who began well with some enthusiasm, but were really having second thoughts, yeah? So, so it, it was important to them to say, look, guys, stay the course. You know, we know it's difficult, but this is a reminder, a godly reminder of why you're here and why you're doing this stuff, you know? And, and the writer says, first one, says, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse two. If you got it, going on strike. I can read it in my Bible if you like. Do it analog. Verse 2, it says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the picture we're being given here is an amphitheatre, isn't it? You know, like the one, you know, we think of like the modern Olympic Games and you've got an amphitheatre and just a cloud of sort of people cheering you on. And here in Hebrews, you've got exactly the same kind of format, haven't you? It's one of those ancient amphitheatres. And, and they're being reminded, he's saying, look, you know, you guys, you're running a race, but you're not running it on your own, on an empty track in an empty stadium. You are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And I like to think, you know, that my life as a Christian, you know, I'm surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that have gone before, you know? You know, when somebody cuts me up on the North Circular or in the Tesco car park, you're thinking, am I going to bail out of my race for 30 seconds and then opt back in again? You know, and you're reminded that you're running your race in an amphitheatre of God with a cloud of witnesses. I've got the Apostle Paul over there cheering me on. You know, Stephen and Barnabas are, are, over there. I've got, you know, uh, uh, other people, Ezekiel. You know, I like to think that is the environment in which we win. You know, people who've been there, done that, gone before and, and are like the saints of old cheering us on. You know, I like to imagine that's the kind of amphitheater I'm running my race within, you know, that I'm not doing it on my own. I'm surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And these people have been reminded in the New Testament, look guys, you know, you're not running it alone. This is all about tactics for a race. And it's a race that has become challenging. You know, whatever happens within a, a race, you can guarantee even if you're very, very good at it, that you'll hit times where you've really just got to keep pressing through. Otherwise, you're going to bail out. You know, that's why it's a race. Otherwise, there's no point in having it. Unless it's a feat of achievement, there's no point in doing it in the first place, you know. And, and I think, you know, God would say, look, be reminded you are not running this race on your own. You are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who wish you well, who are praying for you. You've got the host of heaven there on your side. You know, it may feel like you're the only one, but you've got people really who've been there, done that, who's saying, look, come on, Tim, for goodness sake, 
Get it together. Keep going. You know, you're doing well. You know, you've had a bit of a, you know, setback or whatever, problems with your metatarsal. Don't worry. Keep going. You know, keep going. You will get towards the finishing line, you know. And in the Olympics, well, perhaps now, certainly in the ancient Olympics, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the track race, the running race was the preeminent race. So that took precedence above any other form of athletics. It was just seen as the, the ultimate. And I think that's the picture that's being drawn down and, and used. And I want to get into today, how do we run our race well? Because you can run a race badly, can't you? Yet sometimes people, you know, compete in the London Marathon in like a diving bell suit and finish it like a month later because they've like crawled around the circuit, you know. Uh, and they're more doing that just to say, look, I've done that rather than for speed. You know, so you can run a race but not particularly well. But we're in the business of, of running a race effectively, running the race that God has for you and doing it in a good way, doing it in a godly way. And I think... God would give us, well, I've got at least three keys to running that. And the first one is, say to the person next to you, get fit. Get fit. It is impossible, isn't it, to run a race well unless you are fit. That's perfectly obvious. I'm not a particularly fit person. I'm not a fat person, but just because you're not fat doesn't mean you're, you're fit. I'm not particularly well exercised. But if you're going to win a, a race, you've, physical fitness is really important, isn't it? You know, and, and there's no point in Great Britain having you know, really, really world-class athletes and really bulked out, sleepy, slothful Christians. You know? um, so God says to us, you know, raise and I'm speaking to myself just as much as you, raise your game, you know, because, because we need to be people who are fit. You know, behind all those Olympians who won gold, you know, I think of people like Adam Peaty, people like that, people we'd never heard of before, you know, and suddenly, bang, you know, they're prominent, Rio 2016. Everybody's heard of them. But beneath all those success stories is a story of, you know, getting up on a dark winter's morning at 4 a.m., you know, driving to the swimming pool, you know, doing lap after lap after lap when nobody's cheering you on, when nobody's thinking about Olympic, you know, they keep themselves going and, and regularly discipline their bodies that that moment of glory can come in 2016. Everybody says, wow, how admirable. But beneath that is a story of persistent, of getting fit, of being ready. You know, athletes, you know, they don't compete randomly, do they? They're not randomly going all around the track. They know what they're doing. And, and fitness is important. You know, in the ancient Olympics, they often used to run naked. You know, because Athens is very hot, isn't it? I don't recommend it in Wembley. Please don't try it. But, you know, there's a sense in which... They were kitted out appropriately. And, and being fit doesn't just mean being physically fit. You know, if you're going to run the best race you can, you know, you don't run it with a, with a backpack on your back, do you? You know, I don't strap Benji to my back and go round. You know, it would be a novelty, but it, it's no good for speed. You know, so you really need to be, be stripped down, slimmed down of all the stuff that might hold you back. You know, uh, from sin, it's not just sin, is it? It, it can also be weight. You know, weight isn't always a, a bad thing, but it's just the wrong thing at that moment, you know? You can be holding on to stuff from your past that, that you don't want for, for this current leg of the race. It was all right for a while, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the right thing at the wrong time, isn't it, you know? You can carry a bag fine when you're going shopping, but, I mean, you don't go onto the racetrack with Tesco carriers and all the rest of it. And you've got to remain, look, this is the race. You know, lay aside every weight, you know? Lay aside, get, get rid of it, you know? Any weight, every weight, all weights, whatever it is. You know, it may be a perfectly legitimate care, but you, you need to get rid of it, you know. And the sin that so easily ensnares us. It's not uh, easy, it's not, um, sorry, it's not difficult to get ensnared by sin, is it, you know? And, and athletes, one of those things with those Olympians, I really noticed was how dedicated they were. You know, many scores of them would sort of give testimonies, you know, building up, 
to this for years. You know, I didn't go to lots of friends' birthday parties. I didn't go out lots of Saturday nights because I had to be ready up for training the next morning. You know, they sacrificed something in order to, to get that. Now, I'm not saying don't go to birthday parties, don't enjoy yourself. I don't mean that at all. But they had an absolute iron focus that their life was going to be dedicated to doing this, you know, and they got rid of other things that were perfectly legitimate, but just a heavy weight when it comes to, you know, if you're really going to go for it and win Olympian gold. You know what I mean? So uh, get fit, number one. Number two, we say this together, don't quit. Say that to the person next to you again. Don't quit. Do not quit quit above all else you know even in the natural sometimes it's not the best people that get the prize it's the persistent people the people who when they're knocked down time and time again refuse to take no for an answer you know Jessica Ennis Hill she's just retired hasn't she this week um, but in the uh, you know she really obviously came to prominence in 2012 you know winning that wonderful gold on, the, on that super Saturday where loads of people won like lots and lots of medals but in 2008 she was injured and out of the Olympics she sort of wrecked her she'd done a stress thing on her metatarsal and she had to sit out for 12 months you know completely certainly missing the Olympics but missing kind of loads of other stuff as well you know but it was that ability to get back into training rising up again with no guarantee of success and just picking up the ball again and just going and saying right I'm gonna I'm gonna do do it. I really think I have it within me to, to, to do this, to achieve something incredible, you know. Do not quit. It says, let us run with endurance. You know, it doesn't say let us run with half-heartedness. Let us run brilliantly for the first two minutes, then bail out. It doesn't say let us run really well, uh, stop off halfway around for a Diet Coke put your feet up, get back in when you feel like it. No, it says, let us run with endurance. You know, the word for us is like perseverance, persistence, to keep going. The Greek word for race is agone, which is our word, probably the clues in the name, agony. You know, there can be an element of struggle, can't there? In just keeping in, you know, but the ability to be successful often is just putting one foot in front of another and keeping yourself in it, you know? When you hit a pain barrier, anybody done a lot of running, you hit a pain barrier, don't you, after a while, and the enthusiasm begins to go, and you think, why am I in this? I really enjoyed it, now, but I don't even know why I'm running this at the moment. You've got to keep pressing through that to get out the other side. You need whatever your task, I'm sure you will hit a pain barrier at some stage or another. And it'll be a different pain barrier for you than for me. It'll come at a different time for you than for me. But it's our own personal pain barrier that we need to get through with Jesus and come powering on through to come out the other side. You know, it's not the external circumstances is how we respond to them and, and deal with them. You know, weather happens, doesn't it? You know, and, you know, all sorts of things can, can come our way, can get chucked our way. And, and, and it doesn't matter what, what it is. It matters how we respond and what we do in, in that stress test that we experience, you know. But do not quit. And the other thing that I love here is just the reminder that I'm not running this race on my own, you know? I often see athletes going around the field, but there's a whole team of, of people behind them who have trained them and been with them, you know, nutritionists, doctors, fitness experts, previous athletes who are now trainers, you know, who, who will give them the impetus to get through, you know, and, and I thank God in my life, I know that I'm only here today by the grace of God and through people that he's put with 
within my life, you know, that when I'm going through a difficult time, you know, I can lean on Prempe to hold me up and to keep me on the straight and narrow. There's people that I see every week. That if I begin to go a little bit off, off skewed, off the track, into the cinders, will push me back on again and, and get me sort of back in the race. That whatever happens, it's not just my strength that's keeping me through it, but other people who are cheering me on, saying, Tim, well done, take that weight off, get that sin off your life, it easily ensnares you, get back on the track, get ready, you will make it, you will get to the finishing line, keep going. You know, you're not just running it in your own strength. There was a story during the Olympics, in fact, of a, of a couple of female athletes and um, they... Uh, uh, one was uh, an American, the other was a New Zealander, and, and a lady called Abby DiCostino and Nikki Hamblin. And they said that they embodied the Olympic spirit because one of them had a tumble on the, on the track and the other one could have sort of just forged on and thought, I'm, I haven't trained for four years not to, you know, to just help this person up. I'm going to keep going. But they helped each other back into the race. And they sort of almost finished the race. It was quite good footage of them, like leaning on each other. And it was a qualifying race. And when, you know, it looked like they were both going to be disqualified, the team said, no, look, these were the circumstances. And they both qualified for the actual race. But it was an example where they helped each other. And Christianity and the church, to me, should be like that, where we help each other back on the track to stay up. It's not a one-man race, but it's something that we run with the, with the encouragement and blessing of other people. That if I'm in danger of veering off, you get me back on, and, and vice versa. You know, don't run alone. You know, you don't want to get hit from the edge of the track and have nobody to help put you back in place. Let's go to Hebrews 10, Liz, if that electronic Bible is working. Otherwise, I'll find it. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Recover from stumbles. I think with Mo Farah, both when he was doing the 5,000 metres and also the 10,000 metres, um, he stumbled, didn't he, in both races. You know, it's quite interesting, both of them. You know, even in the midst of when he's really looking to set an incredible record, you know, there was a, a moment of faltering where he had to recover his pace and, and his grip on, on the race. So here we go. Hebrews 10, 23, and we'll do to 25, says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised us is faithful. Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It said, do not forsake the gathering of the assembly. You know, there's some Christians, I used to do quite a bit of door knocking back in the day. And uh, sometimes, you know, you would sort of knock on the door, say, hi, you know, you're a Christian. And I said, oh, yes, I am a Christian, but I do it in my own way. I don't like going to church. You know, and it's like, well, you can never really succeed as a Christian without the involvement of others, having other people there have been through it. You know, I've embarked on the journey of fatherhood quite late. You know, some people, you know, by my, I'm nearly 40. You know, some of my friends, their kids have virtually like grown up and left home by the time, you know, they got to my age. You know, one of my friends, he had kids at 18, he had three kids from the age of 18. So they really, I mean, he was like absolutely shot of them by the age of 40. But, you know, here I am sort of embarking on my own, my own race, albeit late, but better late than never. You know, and I thought when we took our son home from the hospital the first time, you know, it's quite a daunting thing, isn't it? Because you, you think, no, I think I just need a couple more days, a bit more help from the midwives, thank you very much. You know, but here I am go, going home and, and previously, whenever I've looked after a kid, I've, you know, cradled it for five minutes, given it back to its mum. You know, here I, I'm, I'm, I'm the backstop now, you know, for the next 18 years, you know, and, and I appeal to you that, you know, if I, yeah, exactly, 40s, li lifetime, I'm, stu I'm stuck with him. And it's quite a terrifying realisation, isn't it? 
So anyway, all of you who obviously really mastered parenting brilliantly, you'll be able to like put me right. You know, there are other people who've done this before me, but it's a race that I can't opt out of, but I need to not quit and, and keep going. You know, when you're changing his nappy at three in the morning and you want to get to bed and you want him to, you know, shut up and stop crying, there's nothing to be done for it. You just got to keep going and, and pressing on. So perseverance. So get fit, get fit. What was the other one? Lost me thread. Don't quit. Number three, stay focused. Stay focused. You say that to your neighbour, stay focused. We need to keep our eyes on Christ above all else, you know? I'm not saying all the Olympians, you know, they were often doing it for themselves. But we're running our race, not for ourselves, but ultimately for God. And it's Jesus that lies behind the finishing line. And I want Jesus, when I get to heaven, say, well done, good and faithful servant. You ran the race that I wanted you to run. You didn't run somebody else's race. You didn't bail out. You did the thing that I had called you to do. And, and we run it with God's help, God's anointing, God's blessing upon it. You know, in order to finish, we need to keep our eyes on God. Those of you old enough to remember will remember that the um, four minute mile was first run by a man, British man called Roger Bannister. And uh, he ran it in 1954. And uh, he was the first person to do so, you know, first man to run a mile in less than four minutes. Never been done. It's been done since several times. But this is the 50s, you know, didn't have the technology then, didn't have the, you know, the level of fitness, the level of training. It was an immense achievement. And uh, he ran it on a, on a circuit in Oxford. He had not just himself, but his, his friends, so Chris Brasher, Chris Chatterway, as pace setters. You know, before, you know, he says a couple of times, doesn't he, I was so full of running. You know, in other words, you know, he's very, very enthusiastic, obviously, otherwise he wouldn't be doing it. But he didn't want to expend all his energy in the, in the first, you know, the first leg. Otherwise, he wouldn't have enough for the final spurt. And, and it was almost like he was able to relax into the task because other people were setting the pace for him front and back. And those two individuals, the two Chris's, took quite a lot of wind resistance to help protect him as he was going. And he said, I didn't need to worry about the pace because I knew I had them to do that. And I think almost in God, God would give us divine pace setters in the form of Jesus at the finishing line and the Holy Spirit as we're even racing ourselves to enable us to complete it. In other words, our front is covered and our back is covered for success. You know, those two Chris's were with him for his success. And I believe God has um, appointed us to get the goal, to cross the finishing line properly, that when we're in the race, we don't need to worry about the pace. And I think so often in Christianity, we think, oh my God, why haven't I got this now? You know, I've been tithing faithfully and I haven't seen my breakthrough on April the 10th, you know, 2017. You know, and God says, look, don't worry about the pace, worry about the quality of the race you're running. Let me worry about that and I'll make sure you get over the finishing line. And God says, look, I'm more interested in the depth. You know, he said before many times, attitude determines altitude. And often as Christians, we're looking around, looking at the other person. Oh my God, look at him. He's exceeded me. I'm running my race really badly. And you think, no, all that matters is that you are running your race according to God. God's will and that he has that he has you there you know often you know we're not running on a racetrack that's perfect and you think well I wish I knew the bible more I look at other people are so much better than I am you know you wouldn't believe the sort of background and start I've had in life you know like Roger Bannister's racetrack you know you haven't got everything perfectly laid out and God says look I, I, I don't don't worry you know I'm able to get you through all of that I'm able to propel you through all of that whatever happens. I've got your front, I've got your back, and I've appointed you for success. And I want you to run this race and run it 
successfully and to get not just the bronze or the silver, or there's nothing you know, wrong with getting those things in the natural in the Olympics, but to get the gold and to run the race that God has called you to. You know, we have a responsibility, don't we, under God to, to get fit. You know, me as well as you, me more than you. I mean, looking at you, you don't need, I do, you know. I look in the mirror every day, I think I need to be fit. So stay fit, spiritually and physically. You know, do not quit. You know, perseverance, just that ability to keep pressing one foot in front of the other with the help of others, with the anointing of God behind you, and to stay focused, to realise it's not your race, it's God's race, that he has your back, he has your front. There's nothing that alarms or dismays him. You know, Winston Churchill used to say, you know, when asked, Winston, did you ever have any worries in your life? And he said, it's like the story of the old man who said, oh, I had a lot of, I've had a lot of trouble in my life, most of which it never happened. You know, a lot of the things we worry about, they they don't even happen. You know what I mean? And they certainly don't alarm or surprise God. We can never do something. Stuff can never come our way from the side of the track. And God thinks, oh my goodness, what's going on there? I can't believe that's happened. God is in control. He's got your front. He's got your back. Let's rise in his presence, shall we? Lord, we want to thank you that you love us. Lord, we're not running a race to qualify to be loved by you, Lord. We're loved by you, saved by you. Therefore, we are in a race, whether we like it or not. And Father God, Lord, you don't just bung us in and chuck us on an athletics track and say, oh, I hope he, I hope he gets there. I hope he does all right. Father God, Lord, you have appointed us for success in you. And Lord, I want to thank you, that Father, for my brothers, my sisters. And Lord, I thank you that for each one of us, Father God, Lord, you want us to achieve the gold in you of our personal best under you, achieving that thing you have called us to do. And Father, I bless you for that, Father. And Lord, I pray for that that anointing from you, Father God, to run the race well and to finish well in your mighty name. And I just ask if there's anybody here who will be talking about a race, talking about a racetrack, and you're thinking, I'm not sure I'm entirely qualified. I'm not sure that I've joined this thing. You know, if, if you're somebody who you're not sure you've ever properly made a commitment to God to just say I, I want to live for you I want to live my life for you utterly and completely without any distractions if you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus we want to give you an opportunity just to do that right now whilst every eye is closed there's only mine that are open if you want to raise your hand quickly I will pray for you and we'll, we'll join together just to acknowledge your decision to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. You're not running the race of life on your own. You're running it with him on your side and at the finishing line and behind you, protecting you, holding you. Let's say together, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that you would take away my sin and come into my life to give me newness of life. So enable me to be born again and filled with your Holy Spirit for a new life and a new race. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.